Our guests today are Nancy Rothbard, who is the chair of the management department at Wharton, and Juliana Pillimer, a doctoral candidate at Wharton, whose research focuses on organizational behavior. We're going to talk with them today about their paper, which is titled Friends Without Benefits, Understanding the Dark Side of Workplace Friendships. Uh, Juliana and Nancy, thank you so much for joining us at Knowledge at Wharton. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having us. So all of us spend such a lot of time at work, and one would assume that having friendly relations with our co-workers is overall a good thing. Uh, what led you to explore the dark side of workplace friendships? Juliana, would you like to start off on that? Sure, yeah. Um, it's funny that you say that. That was sort of an inspiration for thinking about the complexities because so many people assume that it's just sort of uniformly a good thing. And um, so the inspiration for this paper came, I was actually taking a course with Nancy on um, identity in, in organizations. And this research sort of tapped a sweet spot between a gap I saw in research that's been done and, and observations I made, I saw in the real world. Um, so basically most of the work that talked about the way relationships outside of work influence your, your work were focused on family. And there was almost no research looking at the influence of friendships. And um, for me at the time I was in my mid twenties, a lot of my friends, you know, none of my friends were married, none of them had kids. And the topic of conversation was constantly friendships and how their friendships at work were both really enriching and life-giving and also sort of exceedingly complex and, and even led some people to want to switch organizations at times. And so for me, this was fascinating and I saw an opportunity um, to work with Nancy to sort of dig into, um, you know, friendship at work more deeply and, and not only from this sort of it's uniformly good standpoint, but what are some of the challenges and complexities that accompany friendship? And what I think is so fascinating about this question is that, of course, we don't mean to suggest that friendship is not a good thing, right? It, friendship at work can be really, really valuable to people. But what is really fascinating to us is that it's not this uniformly good thing where there are these complexities, there are these tensions that arise because of a number of features of organizational life which make friendship more difficult to navigate in the workplace. And so what we did was we started to try to explore the juxtaposition between some of these tensions uh, and, and uh, with the features of organizational life. And in particular, what we looked at was the fact that friendship has this informal quality to it, this voluntary uh, nature to it. Um, it has aspects where really the primary goals are relational and socio-emotional. Uh, and it, you know, it really, um, and it really uh, has a, a dynamic which involves communal types of exchange-based norms where, you know, need, you know, if, if I need you, you're going to, you're going to respond. Whereas a lot of features of organizations really focus on things like formal roles mm -hmm. or, you know, you can't always control who you're put together with uh, in a group with. You, you have this involuntary relationships that sometimes are necessitated. Um, there are lots of instrumental goals that you need to pursue, not necessarily relational goals uh, to, to achieve organizational outcomes. And you have a lot of exchange-based or reciprocity norms that really dominate a lot of times rather than need-based norms. And so these different um, features of organizational life, they, they sort of clash sometimes with friendship. And so navigating how to be a good friend within an organizational context can be really challenging. And it does it, and it also has implications for other aspects of the organization. And so those were the things that we really were curious to explore more deeply. And what are some of the <clears throat> insights that turned up as you did, went about your research? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the insights was kind of what Nancy just described, which is that um, sort of the defining features of friendship can be fundamentally in conflict with, with the defining features of organizational life. And that sort of struck us as, um, you know, you see more and more organizations famously 
you know, being proponents of friendship and encouraging friendship and bringing, you know, foosball tables in and all these sort of things that are supposed to bring people closer. And, and as Nancy said, you know, we, we think that that's a good thing and, and more and more sort of an inevitable aspect of organizations. No, you know, it's not, it's no longer is it okay to, to just assume that you'll show up to work and leave and, and not relate with people in most instances. And so, um, you know, what, one one insight basically came, you know, that came up is just that we need to think about how to manage these relationships more effectively given their inevitability. Um, I don't know if you want to. And, you know, a couple of other things. One of the things that's really fascinating to us is that while friendship can have really a lot of individual benefits to people, too much friendship can also lead to distraction in the workplace. It can lead to needing to um, engage with other people in a way that can be emotionally taxing to you if it's too deep. Uh, we, at one point, we had a, a, a line in the paper, in too deep, right? So sometimes you, you kind of go um, into a relationship and you get caught up in some of the dynamics and it can be really distracting to you. Um, another, another insight that we had was that when you are really close friends with people, that can sometimes make it difficult to make hard decisions. Mm. And there's a lot of research which shows that in group decision-making kinds of situations, interacting with people who are really similar to you and who you like a lot that makes it hard sometimes to raise those hard questions and to uh, deliberate really carefully and to not just kind of come to a quick and easy decision, but to really slog through some, some tough stuff. And so, you know, those kinds of challenges can occur as well. So what, what might be an example of, yeah, of so that I mean, kind of a conflict? <laughs> of, of a conflict. So, you know, if, if, you're, if you're in a, a group... Uh, and you're you're trying to make a hard decision about you know perhaps uh, where to allocate you know some of your budget or or what have you, um, and you know different people might have different uh, pieces of information or they may have different perspectives on it. But if they're friends, it can be really hard to go against somebody who's advocating really strongly for one particular position because they might get mad at you, and so you know you might hold back even though you believe there's another direction that might be better for the organization. You might not want to offend a friend. You don't want to, you don't want to step on their toes. And so sometimes that causes us to pull back and not really hash things out so that we can really see which of these options might be better. Um, and so there is, there is quite a bit of research that shows that people do pull back in those kinds of circumstances. And so having these really close bonds can be really challenging. Now, what we also argue in this paper is that when you're really close with people, truly, truly close, so if you're, you know, at, at an extreme, you know, level of friendship, that gets ameliorated a little bit because, you know, you can, you fight with your family, you fight with your friends, and you can make up with them, and it's okay. It's the, it's sort of the middle ground where you're kind of friends with people, but your relationship isn't so secure that, you know, it can withstand the fight that you pull back. And so, you know, there, there's a little bit of a caveat there. So there's a, there's a curvilinear uh, effect that we describe that we think is really important to consider. Um, and there's another category of challenges that we also highlight uh, in the paper, which is that sometimes when there's the, there are a lot of close friendship relationships in an organization, that becomes visible to other people. And mm -hmm. if, if there are certain relationships that are certain people who are close and other people who are not close, then the people who are on the outside looking in can get really yeah. upset. Right. And so it's the classic clique type of situation where, you know, Juliana and I described the high school cafeteria, right? <laughs> it's the classic, it's you know, example. you know, you want to be in the in group and you're not and you kind of see them around the table and that's really upsetting. And so sometimes f strong friendships can have this really, really inadvertent negative effect, not on the people within the friendship, 
or something. But on the other people in the organization mm -hmm. who feel excluded. Right. Yeah. Like yeah, I think just to sum up what, what Nancy beautifully describes, you know, so so part of our one of our core insights was when friendships are considered to be sort of uniformly positive, it's often from the perspective of an individual and does this feel really great? You know, to, it feels awesome to connect with people. It probably makes you want to show up to work. You know, it makes things fun. Um, but you really need to consider these sort of other levels of analysis, you know, where, where it might not be great for group outcomes, it might not be get great for organizational outcomes. So really taking a more holistic look at the impact of what might seem like a great individual relationship and that can cascade in sort of negative ways. And what people need to do is they need to really think about this carefully. So, you know, if you're in this really close friendship, you need to be aware of the impact that's having on other people, right? And you need to be aware that other people might be feeling excluded or you might, you know, need to think about being more deliberately inclusive of other people. Right. Um, things like that are really important to keep in mind because, you know, a lot of times you're in this bubble of the friendship and you're just not aware of the impact it's having on these other organizational outcomes. Now, I wonder how you see the role of technology in all this, because technology seems to have had the effect of blurring the boundaries to some extent between personal and professional relationships. So, for example, there are, you know, a number of my colleagues who are also my friends on social media. Uh, now, is this necessarily a good thing or a bad thing or both? Oh, McCool, you, you, <laughs> you've clearly read our paper <laughs> and, uh, and know our research uh, and, and know the things that are on our minds. So this is something that is so, so centrally on our minds because it's, it's really all around us. And we think it's changing the dynamic of how people are interacting at work. And so this was a, a very big theme for us as we explored this question. So I'm going to turn it to Juliana. Uh, to, to give some thoughts, and then I'll I'll share. Yeah. Mine. So it's interesting how you said blurring the boundaries because we thought a lot about this, and that's sort of the language that people usually use when they when they talk about the the blurring of professional and, and personal boundaries. And when we really thought about sort of what the correct analogy was, we came up with this idea of boundary transparency, right? Mm -hmm. Where social media sort of provides this window into your personal life, you know, whether it's with your kids or, you know, the stuff you're doing on the weekend or, you know, God forbid someone wants to go back and look at what you're doing 10 years ago, you know, in your photos. So it's this really um, something that didn't exist maybe five or 10 years ago in terms of just this one click connecting with with a colleague that almost seems mindless for many people. Um, and it really, it really, is the sort of floodgate of disclosure in this different form, in this multimedia form that can really um, bring you closer, but also maybe lead to some discoveries that, that you kind of wish you didn't know. So. And absolutely, I think that what we, find, what we feel is really critical as an insight about social media and technology vis-a-vis -vis friendship at work is that it, it's, it's amplifying a lot of these dark sides. Mm -hmm. Because it's, I mean, it, it's also amplifying the, the positives, right? It's allowing us to connect to people in ways that, and, and more deeply, right? Mm -hmm. But that also leads to this inadvertent, uh, some, some inadvertent challenges that we've already been discussing and highlight some of them. So, f for example, when you're connected to somebody on social media, that affords you a window into their, into their personal life but it also makes it more difficult for you to dis to tailor some of those disclosures uh, in a way that is more targeted to the person you're talking to. So if I post my pictures from my vacation um, on social media and I'm connected with people at work, they all know that I was in France on spring break and you know that I had my kids there and they've you know they might have seen you know my my kids uh, in some not so great uh, <laughs> situations, right? Or, or they, you know, they might have, um, they, and, and, they, and they, they'll be aware, right, that I wasn't working for the last week. Uh, and that might be okay, 
you know, but maybe somebody was really annoyed at me because they needed me for something and I, they, they think I was just la 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 off in France, you know, on, on vacation and right. they really needed me for something. Um, so, you know, and, and that's like a very, very bland kind of example of what people might post, right? You know, people also post opinions. Yeah. And those opinions may not be shared right. by everyone. And so, you know, these kinds of uh, disclosures on social media and th through the kinds of technologies that we have available, the connection technologies we have available, are really making it more difficult to navigate friendships in more one-on-one um, -on -one ways mm -hmm. because you have this broad... Uh, this broad disclosure to a, or this disclosure to a broader group of people that's not as targeted. Yeah, yeah, and we, I'll just say one more thing. You know, we really know Nancy mentioned that they that social media sort of amplified the specific dark sides that we came up with. So, for example, we, we you know she discussed how the high school cafeteria, right, and you can see in person, you know, the cliques that are forming and and where you stand and. Um, social media is, is a whole new, you know, people are posting photos, you know, I've certainly, I've experienced, I'm sure you guys have experienced, oh, you know, these coworkers went and hung out without me and, and that might be, you know, that might be a surprising thing. You might not have even seen that clique sort of in person in the office. So that's an example of, of how social media can uh, really amplify some of these existing dark sides that have always been there, but, um, but sort of give them new, <laughs> new light. New life. And, and again, I think that it's, it's not always a bad thing, so we want to emphasize that, right? So sometimes when you see you have a window into somebody's personal life, you get to know them more as a person and you have more context for what's going on with them. You know, you may understand that, you know, they were slow to respond on email, but they've just posted that they had, you know, a, you know their, their, a family member was ill. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you may have much more insight and you can kind of you can you can give them a break because you have more understanding of what's going on in their life. So, you know, there can be really positive things to this, too. And we don't mean to suggest that it's all negative. Right. So be based on everything you've said so far, uh, how do you think managers should uh, enhance the benefits uh, which are many of workplace friendships while managing the downside? What, what would be, be your advice to them? That is a great question. Do you want to start? Sure, yeah. So, you know, some of the stuff we've already discussed is, is you know, we think first just managers and leaders having awareness of these, the, that these challenges can even arise. You know, I think that, that that's kind of the first step to you know, okay, if you're, if you're, you know, the CEO of, of some startup and you really want to, you know, create this collegial culture and that's wonderful, um, you know, you might want to also put some things in place to ensure that these dark sides don't occur. So, you know, perhaps every, people maybe don't choose their own teams, but you have sort of people from diff different areas of the organization on teams to guard against challenges with decision making or, um, <laughs> You know, for example, I know like the design firm IDEO, one thing that they do is they have sort of cross-functional lunches or events once a week where you really encourage people who won't usually be interacting with each other, might not be as similar, to ensure that you're not getting that sort of clique silo effect. So um, again, yeah, we're, we're not saying you shouldn't encourage friendship, but but an awareness of the dark sides and, and how to sort of guard against them. Uh, structurally within the organization is, is a really great thing that managers can do. So it's also really important for individuals to set boundaries. And so thinking about how they, how they interact with their friends, sometimes it's really important to set expectations. So, you know, you, you might be very close friends with somebody, but we have expectations that when we're in a meeting, we are going to challenge each other. And we're going to talk about this explicitly up front so that you know I'm not you know, I'm not uh, doing this to because, because I'm annoyed at you. I'm doing this because this is what our job is. Uh, a second, a second thing that you might want to really think about from an individual perspective in terms of setting some boundaries is thinking about you. You might be great friends with somebody, but maybe you set times to catch up with them about various things rather than than having them interrupt you 
when you're trying to get your own work done, right? So setting up lunches with them or having coffee or having a certain time of the day where you do catch-ups. And so those are really important types of rules, if you will, that you need to adopt with your friends to manage that friendship so that it doesn't become individually taxing to you as well. Now, was there anything that surprised you as you went about research? I think that what surprised us is that there's been so little done on friendship at work. Um, I mean, that was that was amazing to us. And we, we really scoured the literature to find uh, studies uh, on this topic. And, you know, there was one study that we found, which was very interesting, that looked at how you know, friendship was important, but it had, you know, these costs in terms of being emotionally taxing to people. And that was really great because that study helped us to really think about both the positives and the, and the negatives of friendship at work. But there were very, very few studies that explicitly looked at friendship. Mm-hmm. And it, it almost seemed like it was a taboo mm-hmm. for people to, to be even asking this question. And that was fascinating to us, right? Because friendship is really all around us at work. We spend a tremendous amount of our time at work. And, and nowadays, with, on, with technolo- connection technology and o- online social media, it's really that, that, that line between work and, and personal is becoming even more and more blurred. And so friendship is really an inevitable part of the workplace. And so the fact that there was so little that we found on it was a little bit surprising to us. Yeah, and, and to build off of that idea, you know, the, the work that did exist largely just sort of <laughs> didn't dig into the complexities of, of what friendship is, what it entails, what differentiates it from, say, a mentoring relationship or, you know, just a casual acquaintance. So so part of the work that we did in this paper was to say, well, what are these core features that differentiate friendship from other kinds of sort of friendly relationships or mentoring relationships? And what are the unique challenges that arise um, from from those features? And then um, we touched on this a little bit, but again, you know, there's been very little distinction between sort of levels of friendship, right? So closeness, maturity, um, status differentials in friendship. And so we tried to touch upon that in our paper to say, you know, how how does, for example, a, a friendship between a boss and subordinate differ from a peer relationship? How does a friendship that's, you know, you've known this person for 10 years differ from a friendship that's burgeoning in the first week? So so we saw our core contribution as, as also digging into those complexities and saying friendship's different and there are all these different flavors of friendship that, that can really influence outcomes. And to build on that a little bit, I think what's also really important, for example, when you do have a friendship across hierarchical lines, which I think is something that, you know, sometimes we see, uh, is you've got to really be much more vigilant about how it appears to other people. And so thinking about being very careful about process and what's called procedural justice, right? Using um, structures and processes and making very explicit your decision-making criteria becomes very, very important when you have people who are friends across hierarchical lines because other people looking in are judging. Mm -hmm. And they're usually looking at it and thinking that the, the person who's the subordinate is getting favoritism. And so trying to manage that is really critical if you've got a friendship that crosses those hierarchical lines, as an example. Uh, Just to to, to wind up, uh, what kind of questions for future research did did come up as you were going about your your studies? Uh, Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, building on what we just talked about, there's so little research and so much more to be done in this area. So we thought that was, you know, there's so many exciting avenues for future research. you know, one domain is is that you know workplaces are really changing, and and much you know this is true of a lot of research, but kind of is built on the idea of of Western educated you know predominantly white male cultures, and and so we think a, a promising future direction is to think about sort of the individual and then organizational culture of you know the people that that are in the business, and and thinking about how that impacts 
outcomes of friendship. So, for example, women might be more communal in their modes of relating and be able to sort of navigate this tension a little bit more effectively or perhaps not, you know, we don't really know. Or, you know, similarly, cultures that are, are known to be more communal in their modes of relating, you know, Asian cultures, Latin American cultures might have a different approach to the sort of individualistic American um, organization. So we think that's a, a great area for future research. And we also think that it's it would be really interesting to look at these uh, aspects of so social media and right. technology because we think that that is a really, really important new way of relating that we don't understand very well. And so that's something that fascinates both of us. Um, and also this, the, you know, this question, and Juliana is exploring this more in her dissertation work, is, you know, this question of authenticity. Right. And, you know, how do you relate authentically to people? Mm -hmm. and, and when do they perceive you to be, you know, um, a, a, a genuine the genuine article, right? Somebody who is is yourself at work, and and I think that friendship and how that plays out in the workplace comes in as well uh, in terms of that that question. Well, they all sound very very fascinating. So hope we'll get a chance to talk about that again in the future. Well, Nancy, Juliana, thank you so much for speaking with Knowledge at Wharton today. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for having it's us. It's been wonderful. Yeah, it's been great. For more insight from Knowledge at Wharton, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu. Thank you.